my name is Lauren Cohen, and I'm the Ellie Simmons Professor of Finance at the Harvard Business School. And so uh, my research expertise is in behavioral finance. And so kind of for the past, gosh, now about 10 or 15 years, I have really dove in to what makes assets priced in the way that they are. And in particular, how they get mispriced, I'm more interested in. And once they do get mispriced, how they get correctly priced. And so I have focused on the behavioral factors and the behavioral issues around that and kind of what really drives investor behavior and more importantly, how that behavior could aggregate up and impact prices and move prices in kind of weird, interesting ways. And so I'm going to describe a recent project that I've been working on called Lazy Prices. And so this project will kind of tell you how I got into it and then you'll see the thesis is very clear. And so I have another project where I was looking at supplier and customer data. In order to do that, it turns out that supplier and customer firms, that they have to report this, in particular suppliers do in their 10Ks, if any customer makes up more than 10% of their sales. And so I was hand collecting that data, and the statute is that they have to report if any customer makes up more than 10%. That's the hard number. And yet I saw a number of really weird instances where they would put in you know, Walmart 3% of sales right, or IBM 4% of sales. And I thought that was really weird because firms aren't known for disclosing things they don't have to. And so as I looked into it, what I realized is that these, what they'd reported is that the year before it had been Walmart 15% of sales and IBM 18% of sales, and then it had dropped below the 10% threshold. And what these firms had done is instead of taking it out like they could have, they just copy and pasted the same paragraph from last year and they replaced the number with this year's number. And so it got me thinking, gosh, could this really be true? Could it be that firms are this lazy that they just go through their reports and they just search and replace last year's numbers with this year's numbers and they kind of pass that off as their annual statements? And so I collected the data of this and so I collected all 10Ks. You can do this from the SEC. And we looked at all the text from year to year. And so we find the following empirical fact that number one, it's massively true in the data. So it turns out your best guess at this year's 10K at almost to like a 95% correlation on average is last year's 10K, right, word for word. And so firms essentially keep everything the same and only change very few parts of the 10K. But here's the neat part for investors. It turns out that when firms do change their 10K by quite a lot, that that has really big implications for future firm operations and returns, okay? And what kind of prediction it has? Well, look, it's unclear, right? It could be good or bad. They could be adding some good statements or bad statements. It turns out on average, they're adding massively negative statements, okay? And whenever you see a change happening, that's bad news at the firm. So it predicts uh, negative future returns, and this is on the order of you know, eight to 22% per year, so these are big returns. It predicts future bankruptcies, future earnings misses, and the idea around this is that, look, what are these 10Ks for? Well, these 10Ks are for firms to disclose to shareholders the things that they have to, and really as legal cover. So as we presented this around, we presented this at the PCAOB and a few other places, the SEC and a few other places in DC, and as we talked to some corporate lawyers, they said, yeah, of course, this was our job to craft these statements, and the CEOs literally told us, say as little as possible while still disclosing the information we have to. And not only that, put it in places where investors are least likely to see. So we still fill our fiduciary duty of disclosing it to shareholders, but we do it in kind of the most hidden way possible. And so we find e exactly this to be true in the data. I'll give you one other example of this, that it turns out that the, the part of the 10K that's most predictive of future returns, I should say changes in this section are most predictive of future returns, is the risk factor section. And the risk factor section, if you ever look through it, it lists all risks that a firm has. And so as we talk to some professional investors, we asked them, this is before they knew our results, we said, okay, what is the section of the 10K that you're least likely to read? And first they said table of contents, and we were like, okay, yes, we understand table of contents, but beside that, which section really are you least likely? And to the person and to the hedge fund manager, they said the risk factors. And the reason is that, of course, they list the risks of the firm, but they also list every other risk under the sun. They say, oh, well, it could be bad weather, or aliens could come down and attack, or like all these other risks. And so it got so extensive and boring that no one even looks at it anymore. And so from some kind of game theoretic standpoint, that's exactly where you'd want to put it if people aren't checking it. And so as we've gone through this, the nice part is that we have not only detected this on the firm side, and this has been growing over time in strength, but we've also been talking to regulators about how to think through this. And so one interesting 
aspect about this growing on the been growing over time is especially given the growth in quantitative tools, we were really surprised that this would be getting stronger. By this, I mean the return predictability. We thought, okay, investors over time are going to have access to better textual analysis tools, and then they can download and process these things and, and just kind of understand them a little more easily. So that's going to attenuate this over time. But this is a two-way game, and that's what's so neat about this. Unlike something like earnings announcement, like PEAD, post-earnings announcement drift, where there's one number and that number doesn't change over time, here both parties can play, right? And so here firms can respond to this fact that investors now have better tools because firms themselves have discretion over the 10K. And we see that in the time series of 10K. So we have this great case at the Harvard Business School that we teach called Eskimo Pie. And I don't know if you know what Eskimo Pie is, but it's ice cream. And this firm's been around like 100 years, right? It's like ice cream on a stick. And so they used to print their 10Ks up through the 1980s in the shape of a popsicle on a stick, a frozen popsicle. If you look at McDonald's old 10Ks, they used to be printed as a hamburger. Harley Davidson used to be a motorcycle wheel. But the average 10K now is like 300 pages, right? It'd be the world's biggest hamburger. You can't print things that easily anymore. So what firms have done is that they've responded to, uh, to essentially investors having better tools by saying, okay, you have better tools, but we're just gonna flood you with so much noise that the signal to noise ratio is going to decrease faster than your tools and the technology behind it is gonna increase. And so we found essentially up to this point that firms have been winning this battle and that these returns have been increasing.